and sit back. Close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths. In through the nose. And out through the mouth. Focus the breath in the lower part of the abdomen. Tracing it all the way down your body. Take one more. And open your eyes slowly. Thank you. That's how I open all of my karate classes. And I'll explain why in just a minute. But first, I'd like to start out with a little bit of a game. So, from now on, whenever I clap my hands, I'd like everyone to stand up as quickly as possible, give a little bit of a hop, and then sit back down again. Can we try it? Now that that's covered, good morning and welcome. My name is Scott Dare, and I'm going to present the first findings for my research for my dissertation entitled From Dojo to Theater, uh, Karate as Training for Actor Presence. I'm going to start today with a little bit of a background, uh, both on this project and on my training, and give a little bit of perspective to the study. And after my perspective for the study is established, I'll explain why I chose to focus the study where I did. And I've got a short demonstration for you. And then I'll get into the main portion of the talk where I'll examine terms and key concepts from both of the fields and how they relate. And then I'll wrap up by drawing some pending conclusions and pointing out what's next for the study. I'll do my best to translate some of the Japanese terms as I go, but if I forget one, feel free to throw a hand up or a shoe at me. I'd rather us all be on the same page than me rambling on with you wondering what a kiai or a dojo is. So, my interests and aims for this project. Uh, in this research, I'm aiming to explore the applications and the benefits that training in karate can have on an actor in training. In my experience, applying karate training to performer training has been beneficial in many ways. And my goal is to examine the overlapping concepts of the two arts. And I want to use concepts and exercises from karate to develop useful tools for performers that they can use across a range of dramaturgies. I'll get into what those ideas and concepts from karate are in a minute. But first, why the clapping? Mm -hmm. Um, can anyone explain what happens to your focus or your body when I clapped? I'm seeing this gesture, a little bit of tension. Um, right, so when you're in a relaxed state and you're open to your surroundings, the average person can see about 190 degrees around them. And obviously you can hear in a full 360 degree scope. But when you get tense or when you uh, foster tension, that 190 degrees shrinks down to about 3 degrees. Now this exercise was initially shown to me by my sensei Kubiak, and sensei in Japanese is a term for teacher, or you could essentially say Mr. Kubiak as well. Um, and it illustrated to me some life-saving advice, that keeping your body both alert and relaxed simultaneously opens your perception, while at the same time preparing you to respond to unexpected attacks. But stressing out and fostering tension in your body leaves you vulnerable to those attacks. And then my sensei said something really surprising that most people get attacked every day. And I thought, mm, not so much. But I went home and I thought a little bit more and I realized that he was right. I remembered back to my last dress rehearsal. It was our second run for the evening, we were in the middle of act two and the director calls out, hold! And immediately the costume designer is on me like a panther trying to pin my costume with a safety pin. Uh, the director told us to go back two pages in the script but didn't mention what line in the script that was, leaving the actors to rewind the script, our emotional trajectory all in our heads, we're trying to rewind our blocking while scenery and lighting is changing around us, and we're trying to process all of this while remaining calm and retaining our quality of performance. 
We were literally under perceptual attack. This lesson has remained part of my daily philosophy ever since. And whenever I go into a stressful rehearsal or a work environment, I always try to cultivate this sense of mind. This is just one of the ways that karate has influenced my philosophy and my lifestyle, let alone my understanding of performance concepts. To situate myself in the field, I should tell you that I've been studying karate now for about 17 years. I started when I was 8 years old. My dojo initially started by teaching the Shoan Ru style of karate, and several years later switched to Shotokan. I mention this only because the two styles emphasize very different elements to karate technique. For instance, in Shoan Ru, you have the kata Pinan Gandan with this move, which is very fluid and sort of embellished. And then you have the equivalent in Shotokan, which is Hian Godan, which has this move, which is very different, but is supposed to represent the same thing. I identify myself as a Shotokan practitioner. Of course, I should say that my experience is that of an American in American institutions of both karate and after training. I can't speak for a Japanese student of karate. I can't speak for all systems of after training. It wasn't until about 10 years after I started training that I started to see the connections and the ways in which my consistent martial art practice had prepared me for dramatic practice. Training in both acting and karate offered me different perspectives and terminology for the physical phenomena that surround breath, posture, focus, and energy, among other things, which helped me to develop and understand both of the practices simultaneously. So why am I focusing on training? Well, for purposes of both time constraint and word count, I'm focusing on research uh, where on actors in training. I believe that Studying martial arts would benefit artists at any stage in their career, and anyone in general. And, but my own experience was training in both of these skills simultaneously, so I wanted to explore the implications of my journey on others. I also focus on training because karate influenced the way that I learned, and influenced the way that I viewed my actor training. Karate gave me a routine method of practice, which gave me intimate knowledge of the mechanics of my body and how it felt to move in a variety of ways. And this greatly improved my comfort and my control of physical expression, which I could then apply to any dramaturgy or aesthetic that I wanted. Campbell Edinburgh argues in his thesis that there is a growing need to assess training processes by the way that they facilitate the actor's self-development and learning, as opposed to the way that they allow actors to embody an aesthetic vision, like naturalistic acting or period acting. It's arguable that we should train actors to embody a specific aesthetic at all. Philip Zerilli outlines that what the actor or performer does on stage ranges from playing a psychologically realist character to the sequential playing of multiple roles to the enactment of tasks without any character at all. There's a new expectation to perform across a wide variety of dramaturgies and alternative post-dramatic aesthetics. This coursework that we've encountered in this uh, program is a prime example. We've covered dramaturgies from Forced Entertainment, Goat Island, Jonathan Burroughs, along with those of Beckett, Ionesco, DV8, Yasmin Vardaman, or Jenny Kemp, to name just a few familiar ones. Contemporary actor training needs to readjust its focus, placing an emphasis on developing a student's self-knowledge and their ability to explore. And this will cultivate an understanding of personal identity as well as the ability to distinguish how to embody an aesthetic vision instead of using prescribed methods that we're unable to deviate from once we leave university. Martial arts gave me self-confidence, discipline, and a detailed understanding of my body-mind, if I'm borrowing Philip Zarelli's terminology. Now, Zarelli uses this term body-mind to describe the embodied understanding of one's experience in their environment. He says that one begins to discover a state of calm and repose as well as a heightened sense of awareness of the body in action, much like the state of relaxed focus that the uh, clapping exercise from the beginning of the lecture seeks to highlight. So I wanted to see if these elements could be developed in actors that had no karate training. So I held some workshops and I experimented with exercises that applied these concepts of heightened energy and focus to some scene work. I have some volunteers here, hopefully. 
um, to demonstrate a brief example of what I did, and then I'll discuss some of the findings afterwards. So this is Hannah and Daisy, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and we can step into the stance. So we're keeping the weight 50 50 and that back foot sort of going 30 to 45 degrees off. And just sort of start pushing the power through the back leg and get focusing on that hot of the center, the point beneath the navel, and those hip rotations. Just keep it nice and relaxed at the moment. Don't forget to breathe. And then start locking into that square position. So as the back leg straightens, the hips lock square, the shoulders become square with it, the body starts moving as one. Start sinking that with an exhale. And put your hands on your hips. Throwing that hand out nice and relaxed, keeping the energy flowing, not forgetting about the back leg and the center, because that's where the power is coming from. Good. And now start tensing up at the end of the punch. So the whole body becomes rigid all at the same moment. With the breath.
when compared to running the scene with just the dialogue on its own. The structure aims to embody the metaphor with the scene partner in a dramatic context. Actors on stage need to be aware of both themselves and their partners, and each line and action given by an actor should be perceived and responded to. By implementing a structure that forces each actor to physically respond to the lines with that down block uh, and the actions of their partner, the response ideally becomes habitual, and even when the structure is removed, the feeling of the physical response remains. In this way, the performance and the emotional response is not thought up or intellectualized on stage, but it should be evoked by an internal response that has become embedded in the physiology of the actor. That's the goal. I stress the importance of the center, or the Hara or Dantian in Japanese, which is this place sort of two inches below the navel, and it's the source of all the breath and the key energy, which I'll get into in just a minute. Uh, the Hara is a point, yeah. It's the center of gravity in the body, and it's also the source of all the power and the technique in karate, like I was talking about, that's sort of where the hips rotate around. Uh, proper hikite and that's the Japanese concept of hip rotation, it is used to generate power from the center of the body as opposed to relying on just the strength in the arms. Now the actors were focused on the physical tasks and their bodies, and they seemed to stop making decisions and judgments in regards to the scene, which is, I think, especially apparent in the first time that they run through with the ki at the end of the line. The cerebral focus is on the structure and on the scene partner, which meant that new things could be discovered in the text because the actors are unable to force any preconceived ideas on the text or on their vocal performance. This is just one of the things that came about in the workshops and the rest I'd love to explore, but we'll have to wait for the written portion of the study. Now drawing parallels between two differing systems of actor training can be really difficult especially when they use terms with cultural definitions that have shifted and avoided concrete descriptions. Some Japanese terms don't have a direct translation in English. One fundamental task in speaking about these arts' influences on each other is finding where the terms of each discipline can overlap. So here are some of the main terms that I've been exploring. <coughs> Hime and focus, energy, ki or chi energy, chi is the Chinese term, and presence. So kime literally translates to the act of deciding, but in my karate training, kime referred to the moment of aggressive tension in the body that amplifies the power and the efficiency in a technique. It's the deciding or the committing to the execution. Now the question is, how does that improve karate technique? Well, the laws of physics say that energy transfers more quickly and more efficiently between solid objects. However, it's easier to generate more energy when the muscles are relaxed, because we're able to move faster and generate more momentum. So a proper strike then will combine the speed and the power of a relaxed body, and then stiffen at the moment of impact to maximize the damage transferred onto the opponent. So we have this sort of relaxed bit that uh, we started with, and then finally, the tension of the punch. Bruce Lee could snap a board that was about two and a half inches thick, from only one inch away by mastering this ability. It was appropriately called his one inch punch, and I highly recommend looking it up, it's incredible. That juxtaposition of relaxation on one hand and the tension and the focus on the other hand uh, gives karate its perceived intensity. Training to control that level of tension in your body on that level of detail develops an acute awareness of stage tension. For instance, I know that my hips are really tense right now and that can restrict movement and make me look stiff on stage. By training to feel the difference, I can better attend to my physical energy, both in performance and in everyday life. Which brings me on to energy. Now, energy is a term that's used to describe a lot of things in performance, but as a term, it's too vague, it's too ambiguous. The task for the actor is to be able to discern how their director or their teacher is using the term so that they can better adjust and improve their performance. For example, if I'm rigid in my understanding of the term, and my actor gives me a note about my energy on stage, I may misinterpret their conclusion, their corrections, and adjust my performance incorrectly. The most useful description and the most encompassing definition of a good stage energy was given to me by my professor Jim Kirkwood. 
He used the term positive energy and assigned it five attributes. It had to be relaxed, economic, sustained, aggressive, and purposeful. And what I like about this is that it gives the actor and the director concrete elements to critique and adjust in performance. For instance, if I'm going to pick up this water, I may have an aggressive, sustained energy, but maybe I'm really tense, so I need to relax a little bit. Or maybe I'm picking it up, but I'm really embellishing the performance, so I'm picking up the water, and really I just need to be more economic with my movements and just pick it up. Um, so in this way, we can identify specific attributes and physical qualities in a performance, and then adjust them until they reach the appropriate level for any given aesthetic or dramaturgy. And this is also useful in adjusting different physical attributes for different performers, so you can achieve a uniform style or, or acting um, in an entire ensemble. But what does this have to do with karate? Well, all of these elements are trained in the execution of any karate technique. Every technique needs to be relaxed, economic, sustained, aggressive, and purposeful. For example, in order to maximize the efficiency of a technique, it needs to be economic and not embellished. If I'm hooking my punch even slightly, then the power and the energy that I'm developing in my body isn't going into my opponent, it's going to be used to change the direction of the punch. And I'm going to be less efficient in transferring that energy to my opponent. I'd like to highlight specifically that two of the elements assigned to positive energy are relaxation and aggression. And these are the same two elements to kime, or to snap. And that's what gives the technique in karate its power. As I stated earlier, it's the combination of the relaxed muscles generating the energy and the power uh, than the aggressive tension that generates all of that energy. In this way, when energy for performance was finally described to me with these attributes, I could immediately relate my performance to my karate practice. As G Eugenio Barba states in the Dictionary of Theater Anthropology, in Bali, energy is defined by the term bai, or wind. In Japan, the term used is kiai, spirit or breath. Uh, but what are these but what are the actual means used to raise the wind which animates the performer's actions? It has to do with the mastery of a well-articulated differentiation between soft and strong tensions. Once again, we see a reference to this juxtaposition of relaxation, or soft energy, and kime, or hard energy. I find similar parallels between the Asian martial disciplines and the Western concepts of stage energy. It's no coincidence that these terms for breath and energy in the martial arts can also describe a quality of performance. It's important to note as well that this quality is not only visible in the movements of these arts, but it can be present, present in stillness as well. Barba comically quotes Stanislavski berating a student for failing to stand in rhythm and explains the appropriate rhythm for stillness as a state of awareness and readiness for action. Once again, not far from the state of awareness that the clapping exercise seeks to highlight. Now, qi, or the Chinese qi, is an elusive term to discuss. It's imbued with a really heavy sense of mysticism in the Western world, and as soon as I mention it, it immediately conjures up images of the old man on the hill moving very slowly through the mists. <laughs> uh, but the word itself has many meanings in the Japanese language, and it has no direct translation into English. It can mean the color yellow, a receptacle or a vessel, a tree, a gas or a fragrance, among other things. The most pertinent translation, which I've mentioned before, <coughs> and I think is most often borrowed in the West, is spirit. We borrow the term partly because there's no direct translation and partly as a fetishizing of the Eastern spirituality. My Asian martial, many Asian martial arts utilize and teach principles of Qi, but they may call it something different. We have Pranavayu in, from yoga, Qi in Tai Chi Chuan, or Qi to Karate and Aikido. Although similar in principle, each art understands this energy in slightly different ways. Moreover, different teachers from the same discipline may discuss or teach concepts of energy or ki, or some of them don't mention it at all. So this has led to a debate, confusion, and a widened ambiguity in the term. One thing that the arts do seem to agree on is that the energy, this life force, or this pool of spirit, starts with the breath. In each of the arts mentioned before, tai chi, karate, yoga, aikido, Lessons often begin with the breathing exercise, much like the one that I opened the lecture with. Breath is used to relax the body, synchronize it with the mind, and heighten the body's awareness. 
It's used to generate power, intimidate opponents, and push our bodies to their absolute limits. On the other hand, breath seems to be a greatly underdeveloped concept in the West. Very few arts, sports, or practices place an emphasis on the breath to the same extent that the martial arts do. In fact, in karate, the ki, which is different from the ki that Barbara mentions as the energy for no theater, it is the first thing that's taught to your students. It's a kind of yell or the, the execution of the breathing that I demonstrated with uh, Hannah and Daisy earlier. Um, the ki is used to tighten the muscles of the body, it protects the vital organs, and it channels and focuses the energy through the body. And this focus of understanding of breath is, I think, fundamental to the development of actor presence. Now, Jane Goodall makes the argument that there is a curious Orientalist tendency that has crept into the discussion of stage presence, as if it were necessary to go to Bali or India, Malaysia or Japan, in order to connect with the larger energies of theater. And this is reflected in many actor training systems, starting with the influence of yoga on Stanislavski's system, or something more modern, like Philip Zarelli's teaching of yoga and Kalari Payatu, which is a southwestern Indian martial art in his psychophysical actor training. But I disagree that this is for motivations of exoticism or spiritual heritage. I believe that it may be because that all of these arts cultivate an awareness of breath and a heightened physical awareness. As Joseph Chaikin wrote in The Presence of the Actor, the first step in preparation is for the actor to find in himself one clear place. Let's say the place from where the breath is drawn. Not the breath, but from where the inhalation starts. An actor who is fully emotionally prepared is filling the cleared space, and all this functions against discovery. This is very reminiscent of the Zen practice of clearing the mind through focusing on the breath that's centered in the hot, or that point two inches below the navel. There is a large body of discourse surrounding the idea of stage presence, and it is often debated to resist definition and elude description. It is a named element of experience that is perceived and named, but not entirely understood. It's analyzed in terms of energy, countertensions, juxtapositions, something scientific and uncanny, relaxation, physical alignment, and virtuosity. But these are all things that are able to be concretely analyzed and developed in the human body through a physical training, and they all start with awareness. Using karate as a launch pad, we can train our energy and our tension by training our psychophysical awareness. And all of that begins with the breath. I'm eager to look more into this process in the written portion of this project. So to wrap up, I want to emphasize that there are, these are all preliminary findings, and there's still plenty of work to do. But through a consistent and routine practice, I do believe that karate can develop in the actor the following. A tuned and strengthened unified instrument or body a heightened psych psychophysical awareness and perception, and an understanding of embodied control or power, that key, may, key energy and presence, that can be modulated and used and controlled in performance. All of these are useful in a range of theatrical practices, as well as in everyday life. And I'll finish with one quote from Joseph Chapkin. I think that each step of acting requires an actor to return to a conscious awareness of what he is doing. There are zones in us which know more than we think they do. The secret is knowing how to listen to them. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Scott, if you'd like to stay there for a minute. Um, we've got a few minutes. Um, if you'd like to respond with a comment, uh, reaction, or, or you've got a question for Scott, that would be really great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, in, obviously, when you're presenting something like this, you're going to present the positives. But I'm curious about the workshops that you ran. Did you come, did you encounter your difficulties of bringing these very different modes of working together? Or, or, or were there some perhaps negative responses? How did it work? I think that the biggest difficulty is trying to stop the habits of actors. Um, I think they fall into certain patterns or they read a certain line like, oh my god, and I feel like that has a very specific 
habitual reading, and so how do you break away from that, and how do you break a, an actor out of what they think is the proper reading, and just sort of let the lines and the, the dialogue flow for themselves. So I think that's sort of where the inspiration came for that first run through, where following the emphasis of the key eye on the technique, if you put the key eye at the end of the line, I think it follows the energy all the way through, so you avoid that issue of dropping lines at the end, or energies, or you get people that sort of are present on stage, but only when they're speaking. And it's kind of, ah, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening. Now I'm acting, you know, and so you see that kind of habit, I think, develop sometimes. And by keeping the energy following all the way through the line, and keeping the body engagement through that habit, or through, through the entire scene, then you can break that habit of sort of following energies or um, disengagement. So, but yeah, that was sort of my main struggle, is trying to break what they think is the proper way and sort of letting it happen. Um, there's a kind of tension again in what, in what you were just saying there, just to kind of continue on from, from Libby's point, which is that um, obviously you've been training this since you were eight years old. Um, the students you were working with, I don't know, did it for how many weeks? Uh, two. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what is it that you're doing as a teacher in terms of your expectations? Because you say you're couching this in, in, in terms of the possibilities, which I'm not trying to denigrate in any way. Um, but I'm just actually wondering, in practice, when you're actually on the ground and you're working with people in a very limited amount of time, right. um, what is actually their understanding of what's going on and how can you gauge that? Well, I mean, obviously, the longer you practice, the more comfortable the movements become. And that's certainly what I've found as you train longer and longer, the this sort of hip rotation doesn't become as foreign. So I suppose there is definitely an elementary understanding and you risk sort of them brushing over some of the deeper concepts. But it's, I think it's difficult to pinpoint that feeling or that perception in other people. I think really it has to come from an internal experience. It's something that's witnessed and, and lived as opposed to simply observed. Uh, like I said, it's sort of developing that, that internal awareness of the tension in your body of being able to use that energy that you discover. And I think that discovery can only come with extra practice. Uh, so it is difficult to pinpoint how the training has affected their physicality, but in the context of the specific scene, they didn't know the scene, they didn't know the play before I gave them the script, and I mean, they memorized the, the script over the weekend, but before that, there was sort of a, uh, there seems to be an immediate tension and relationship that's developed through the, the even just the physical engagement, because engaging your body, I think, engages something more than just, oh, this is what I think the scene is about, and it becomes more about how you're interacting with your partner. I that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I was wondering if um, the physical exercises uh, were related somehow to the action of the scene. Like if you, if you chose uh, 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 the exercises uh, to have kind of intention or uh, uh, you see what I'm or kind of logic that is similar to the scene or if it's in a way a metaphor or mm -hmm. if I think, yeah, in a way, this is definitely a happy accident, but in some of the other scenes that I ran, I think a heightened energy is applicable, whether it's a love scene or an argument or, or a scene that's enacting, you know, gestures without any characters, as Philip really says, but um, yeah, I did, I did implement it on a, a love scene, actually. Or it's a, it was a monologue that I worked with, and the characters just were saying, oh, love is awful because once you fall in love, you're totally helpless and you're out of control, and it's sort of this really emotional release um, that's happening throughout the entire piece, and when I put that over an exercise like this, I wish I had the video prepared. Um, unfortunately, I don't, but um, I think it, it is applicable to a range of possibilities. In line with that, I wonder... For me, this seems, the, certainly the extract we saw, seemed very heightened, I think, um, in terms of how it was a mode of performance. 
I wonder in, in, in performance itself whether some of that would be stripped back um, and kind of you take the energy of, of the action and, and kind of rediscover the internal logic of the scene or whether you would as a director keep that very heightened um, style in it. Yeah, I think it definitely remains. I think the, the, the idea is that once you learn how to use that energy and to keep the energy going through, no matter what the line is, whether it's oh my god or oh, um, as long as you can feel the difference between oh and oh, um, even though it's a subtle difference, I think it can, it, it exists beyond just this movement. I think it, even if you take that away, there's still the physical embodiment of that.